Welcome to another edition of the Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. Please allow me to introduce uh, our guest. Our guest today is John Warlow, who's written several best-selling books, but today we're going to be talking about the art of selling your business. You can see those books right behind John's head uh, right now. So, John, it's just a thrill to have you on today. I've been getting your emails for quite some time, so I've been already following you, and, and, and I already put out to everybody uh, your uh, URL, and if they would like to follow you and get some of the free things that you have on your site, they'll be able to do that. And Maybe you could just tell them a little bit about what they'll find on the site, and then I'd like you to talk about your background and how you got here. Yeah, well, it's great to be with you. I heard your intro, and I'm like, academics. I'm like, oh, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope I fit the other bucket. Yeah, I've, I've been involved, I guess, in a couple of businesses that I've started and exited. Uh, I got inspired by a, a meeting I had years ago with a guy named Perry Miele, who, who really revealed for me what drives the value of a business. And that meeting was a, a huge change in my career. And it led me to lead uh, to, to write the book, Built to Sell, and then followed up with the automatic customer and the art of selling your business. So that's me in a nutshell. Well, so uh, why did you end up writing this book? And yeah. um, who's the right audience for this? Because according to the book, maybe the right audience should be maybe a little bit larger companies than let's say companies uh, with a million in sales, which are 28 million to 32 in this country. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it, we, we need to take a step back and, and, and I'll talk about sort of why I wrote the book Built to Sell, which refers, I referred to this meeting with this guy, Perry Miele, that was groundbreaking for me. I had built a, 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 a market research firm. We did quantitative market research, very large uh, enterprise customers. So we did work with Bank of America and Microsoft and these giant organizations. And I had built it thinking that the client list would be really valuable. And that when I wanted to sell the company, somebody would want to buy my client list. And we had great profits. We were about five or $6 million in revenue. We 20 to 30% profit margin. So it was a big, you know, relatively big successful company. At least it was in my mind. And I went to see this guy named Perry Miele based in Toronto. And I, and I said, Perry, you know, what do you think it's worth? And I, I think mean, I was rubbing my hands together for the number, right? And, and he says, well, hold on a second. It kind of depends on the answer to a couple of questions. I said, okay, shoot, what are they? And he said, well, your research, who does the research? I'm like, well, you know, I, I do some of it. Like, I, you know, it's, Bank of America, I've, you know, some, I've got to be involved in that kind of deal. And he's like, all right, well, who does the sell? I'm like, well, I, I do some of the selling because it's these big clients and they don't yeah. want somebody else to show up. They went, yeah. And he said, John, I, I got, I got nothing. I got nothing. I, I can't sell your company. It's, it's not worth anything. It's worthless. And I tell you, Mark, that, that meeting is seared into my memory. It, it's, it was 25 years ago to give you a sense or 20 years ago. But it's seared into my memory as, as the day that I really learned, I think, what people value in a company. And that is that it has to really be able to succeed without the owner. Uh, and that's, that's the problem for consulting me. firms in particular. Well, I think consulting firms, any professional services firm or any services firm in general, where the work is done by the people in the business, the, you know, the assets go up and down the elevator, as David Ogilvy said, uh, has a really, really difficult time with this, with this concept. Uh, but it's not just service businesses. In my experience, it can be all kinds of different businesses where the owner is the rainmaker, is, is holding the thing together. And so anyways, that, that, that day kicked off this lifelong journey for me. We, we transformed that company uh, by creating a subscription model, reducing the number of things we did, hiring salespeople. Ultimately, it was acquired by a New York Stock Exchange listed company uh, in 2008. So I wrote about sort of the concept of, of transitioning a business to one that was sellable and built to sell. And, uh, and that audience is really for entrepreneurs who uh, find themselves stuck in their company and would like to create something that's not so dependent on them, create some freedom over their time. Uh, and, and that's really the idea behind Built to Sell. Before we jump into the book, just tell them a little bit about your company, which I think is quite interesting, Value Builder. 
Yeah, we're a practice management software for professional advisors who want to add a value building practice to their firm. So we have a whole marketing automation software along with a learning management system and a CRM system for advisory firms that want to add value building as an offering to their firm. So we work with and we license that to accounting firms, consulting firms, coaching firms. So let's get into the book. Uh, what's the art you mentioned behind selling a business? <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I, everybody thinks valuation is based on, you know, objective measures, right? Like revenue and profit. And, and, and of course, what I've, I do a podcast called Built This Already, where I've interviewed 300 people who sold a company. And what I've seen is two acquirers can look at the same business and arrive at vastly different valuations for that company. And it's really comes down to sort of how one positions the business. I'll give you an example because I think it might drive it home. There's a company called Embanet, uh, run by a guy named Stephen Wells and Jeffrey Feldberg, who I interviewed uh, years ago. And they started off doing web design for universities. So if you're a University of Arizona, if you're Vanderbilt and you want a website, they would do that website for you. And in the early days, they got an offer, which was very similar to the traditional offers that, uh, you know, um, uh, web design shops got, which is around three times profit. That was the offer, the acquisition offer they received, three times their, their EBITDA effectively. And Feldberg and Wells said, you know what, like that's pretty low and it's just sort of a crappy multiple and we want to do better. And so they kind of looked at their business and tried to think about how they were positioning it in the marketplace. And they realized that what they were doing was not talking about their business in a way that would make acquirers excited. They were just a web design shop. And who wants to buy yet another undifferentiated web design shop? So they changed. And what they changed to do is they said, we're part of the burgeoning e-learning industry. And we're not just a web design shop. We help universities get into the e-learning space. And at the time, e-learning was just exploding, right? Linda was acquired by LinkedIn. LinkedIn itself was acquired by Microsoft. All these sort of e-learning companies were just exploding. And Embanet changed their positioning and really thought about how they were talking about their company, their website, et cetera. Anyways, long story short, two years later, they got an offer of 13 and a half times EBITDA. Wow. An incredible transformation. And they did other things and they made amazing changes to the business. But I think one of the fundamental things they did was, was start talking about their company in a different way. And I would encourage anybody to listen to this. Think about the way you talk about your company. Because I think acquirers use shortcuts, just like we all use shortcuts. Like recent Trout, when in the famous book, The Battle for Your Mind, it's 40 years old now, he, he talked about don't try to recreate what's already in the mind of the consumer. You want to attach your brand or your marketing, your idea to what already exists in the mind of the consumer. And so right now, if you're thinking about selling your company, the consumer is an acquirer. And acquirers are looking to buy certain types of businesses. In those days, they were looking to buy e-learning companies. In virtually any industry right now, there are private equity groups looking to roll up businesses in specific industries. And so if you look like one of those industries, everything from the way you talk about your company in a presentation to a business card, it can help you uh, attract the attention of acquirers. And again, that's where I think the art comes in, Mark. It's not just what some valuation expert says is the value of your company. I think it comes heavily down to how you position it, the marketing you do, and the way you package your company. Mm -hmm. And I thought there was a great example you talked about here, which I guess is somewhat similar to what this guy had done. You mentioned the sale of a $9 million payroll company for $54 million. And I wonder what goes into figuring out the value of a company, because I would like to know how WhatsApp doing 50 million at the time ended up, I looked it up before um, we got on, for 21 billion in 2014. These are big numbers, Mark. <laughs> yeah, really, really big numbers in the spread. I mean, it's a $50 million company. What, you know, it's like a ridiculous multiple. So, yeah. I, I'm a, and I'm assuming that some of it has to do with the IP they have, but Tell us about that. How did, how did they arrive at these kinds of figures? How can you get That's those yourself? 
Yeah, let's start to define the three types of buyers. So there's individual investors, there's private equity groups, and there are strategic advisors, strategic buyers. Individual investors usually borrow money to buy your business, and they're only going to be able to borrow the amount that the bank is going to lend them. And the bank is going to lend them on a fairly modest multiple of earnings. And so individual investors pay the least for your business, and they base it on what they can borrow. Private equity groups are in the buy low, sell high game. They're effectively trying to buy your business for as low as they can, flip it five, seven years later for as much as they can. That's their business model. Again, they use leverage, i.e. bank money. And again, they have to stay within bank covenants for what they pay for your business. So generally speaking, they pay a relatively muted model or uh, mic uh, multiple of EBITDA. Where you get the sexy multiples, where you get the big outlier stories, like the one you're referring to, the $9 million payroll company that sold for $54 million, that's when a strategic buyer buys your business. And a strategic buyer is not using some arbitrary multiple to arrive at a value for your company. More often than not, they're trying to figure out what your company is worth in their hands. In your hands, it's worth whatever dividends you take out of it, how much you know, salary you make. In their hands, it may be worth much more. I'll give you, I'll give you the story on this, this payroll company. Stephanie Breedlove, amazing, amazing entrepreneur. She builds a payroll company after she has a child herself, wants to hire a nanny to pay that, and then wants to pay that nanny legitimately. She calls a payroll company and they transfer her phone call like nine times because nobody wants to deal with one person with one payroll. They want to do payroll for tens of thousands of people. And so she got has this terrible experience and she realizes that there might be a company opportunity or business opportunity in creating a payroll company just for parents who have a nanny to pay. Long story short, she starts that company and she reaches a point very early in her tenure, $300,000 in revenue, small business. It's just her and one assistant. When she kind of reaches a plateau on how and, and, and her ability to grow and she's trying to figure out how to grow and, and she sees two roads in front of her. One is to potentially sell additional things to her parents. So meal delivery services, snow removal, so all, all things busy parents need. The second road would be to go find more parents who have a nanny to pay. And every business pundit at that moment was telling her that it's nine times easier to go cross sell existing services, et cetera. But to her credit, she didn't do that. She focused on doing the one thing that she was good at, which is payroll for nannies. Anyways, long story short, the company grows to nine million in revenue just doing payroll for parents who have a nanny. Well, she looks out of the universe and say, who are the strategic buyers for this business? It's 25 years later, she wants to sell. And she realizes care.com would have a really strong value proposition of buying her company. Care.com is like the Angie's list of care providers. You plug in your zip code and it gives you baby oh, perfect. Start, start ready, right? Seven million subscribers at the time that Stephanie reached out to them. Stephanie had 10,000 customers, $9 million business, 10,000 customers. She went to Karen and said, man, you've got 7 million parents who need to pay their babysitter. 7 million parents who need to pay their nanny, their au pair, whatever. What if 1% of the 7 million bought my payroll service? That's 70,000 customers. That's yeah. a business seven times the size of the one I built today. Anyways, that's how she got care.com to spend $54 million to buy a $9 million company. Yeah, I, I love that. That's yeah, boring. the secret is, is thinking about what your company is worth in the hands of a strategic acquirer. You're, you're right about that. I helped to one of my family businesses sell. When I was looking for the sell, I looked for somebody across the country who would like an East Coast presence. And I ended up having five companies bid for them and I didn't mm. contact a single person which who was in within 300 miles of them uh, to look at them because I knew there wouldn't be any real value for them but there'd definitely be value for the people in the West for a lot of different reasons not just mm. the East Coast clients. You write about the eight things choirs look for. What are they? Uh, yeah, well, there's lots of stuff that we can Or the in. main things, at least. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So look, financial performance is going to be important, for sure. That's revenue, profitability, how well you keep your books. Growth potential is also important. So not only how you've done in the past, but also what you're going to do in the future. Recurring revenue is another major driver. So how how much of an annuity system you've created in your, in your company. Uh, and making that switch is, is really tough. You know, I talk a lot about um, 
about recurring revenue and how important it is to the value of your company. Because again, if you're in the, if you're an acquirer, you wear the acquirer's hat for a moment, you're going to write a check to the owner and they're going to kind of drift off to the sunset. You need to know that that business is going to continue to thrive. And one of the ways they do that is to understand what the recurring revenue is. And so when I talk about recurring revenue to, to business owners, oftentimes if they're in the software space or the media space, they get it, right? They're like, yeah, that's how we, that's how we charge. But if they're in a different industry, maybe it's uh, manufacturing or distribution, um, even retail, oftentimes they kind of look at me sideways and say, well, well like that's just not the way our industry works, right? Like it's, that's, that's, we, we have a transactional business model. We have, we have, you know, and I tell them the story of H. Bloom because I think, H. Bloom is a great example of a business that really threw out all the industry sort of averages and, and, and sort of uh, uh, norms. H. Bloom was in the business of selling flowers. And if you know flowers, it's a tough industry, right? Like the, you know, the, the farmer cuts the flower off the stem, it starts dying, right? It's in your fridge for a few weeks and it's turning brown. You, typical flower store in America throws out more than half of its inventory. Oh, wow. Didn't know Huge seasonality, right? Like Mother's Day, Valentine's, we all buy flowers. <laughs> and then you're stuck waiting for those days to, um, you have to buy really expensive real estate or rent really expensive real estate to kind of capture people as they're walking down the street. It's just a terrible business model. Anyways, along come these two guys, Sanyu Panda and Brian Burkhart, who wanted to be in the business of selling flowers, but they said, we're going to do it differently. We're going to sell on subscription. And you might say, like, why would anyone buy a subscription to flowers? And you'd be right. Most people wouldn't, <laughs> right? But what they discovered was that there was a very small segment of flower buyers that actually wanted flowers on a recurring basis. And that was these boutique hotels, these fancy hotels, like the, the we were talking about Los Angeles before we hit record, like, uh, you know, the, the Beverly Wilshire and Beverly Hills Wilshire in Los Angeles or the Ritz Carlton in Chicago wants a fresh bouquet of flowers on their reception table. And so H. Bloom sold them a subscription to flowers. The average lifetime value of an H. Bloom subscriber is more than $4,500. One sale, they make one sale, they capture $4,500 worth of revenue. Wow. The average transaction in a flower store is around $50. So you just think about the economics of that. They can, H. Bloom can hire salespeople. They can hire, I mean, it's a totally different business. And I tell that story because I think it helps people who are maybe stuck in an industry where it just doesn't apply to us to maybe open their mind a little bit to say, if you can sell flowers on subscription, you can sell just about anything on a recurring revenue model. And it has a huge impact on the value of your company. So what, what, are there any other things that you think they should know about uh, when acquirers are looking uh, besides the reoccurring revenue contracts? Well, you know, is there anything that people typically don't think about that they need to think about? I mean, there's a ton. Look, the Switzerland structure is another thing we talk about at Value Builder, and it refers to, uh, how, you know, it inspired by the country of Switzerland, and we all know Switzerland is like obsessed with independence, right? Like it's a joke, it's the butt of a joke, right? When you want to be Switzerland, you want to, you don't want to take sides. Yeah. And so we give that name, uh, the Switzerland structure, to companies that are not dependent on any one customer, employee, or supplier. And so those are, are three things that, that often drive, drag down the value of your company. So if you have a dependency on a single customer, not surprisingly, that's going to drag down the value of your company. Or it could make you susceptible to an earnout where you don't get your cash up front. You've got to earn it over time. The second uh, is employees. So if you have a key employee or two or maybe one great salesperson, that can drag down the value of your company because they're going to say, well, if that salesperson leaves, you know, there's not much company left. Uh, and increasingly supplier is also up there. And, and supplier is a funny one because we often forget about supplier, right? It's, it's the plumbing of our company, et cetera, but, but it can have a big impact. I'll give you an example. There's a guy named A.D. Pinar out of South Africa. I interviewed on Built to Sell Radio a couple of months ago. And he built a company uh, doing uh, cart checkout. It, like, it's, it's, uh, it's an email company. It, it doesn't really matter, it's a software company. And he decided to become part of the Shopify app store. And when he built up his company, it became very successful almost because of Shopify. So as more people use Shopify as a, as a checkout tool and a website builder, 
not surprisingly, he, his email software, which was designed to work with Shopify, also grew and expanded in, uh, in, in presence. But what also happened is the, the, something we call platform dependency, where he became more and more dependent on, on Shopify as his platform, such that it actually detracted from the value of his company, because people argued that it wasn't very valuable without Shopify. And Shopify and Amazon and you know, iTunes and all these big platforms manipulate their algorithms all the time. And if you do, if they do, and it impacts your business, it can detract from the value. So suppliers are also a, a key element of the Switzerland structure, this overall sort of major driver in, uh, in what, what drives the value of your company up. And again, down if, if you're scoring poorly on Switzerland structure. Uh, in, in the beginning of the book, you had a list of questions that sellers ask, and, and this one I went through myself, actually, uh, for a couple of sales. When should I tell my employees and customers, and when should I let them talk to my customers and employees, the buyer? Uh, never. <laughs> never, <laughs> let your, ne never let the acquirer talk to your employees. Uh, yeah, look, this is one of those really, really difficult uh, times in life where what is morally correct is strategically wrong. What do I mean by that? I mean, most people who have a business feel deeply indebted to their employees. They, they treat them like family members. They feel like family members. They feel enormous you know, gratitude to those people who've helped them build a successful company. And so it's very natural in the early days when you decide, you know what, I'm thinking of selling my business. You want to tell your employees, right? It, it's only natural to be truthful and transparent with the people that have sort of bought you to the dance, so to speak. Uh, yet it's the very wrong thing to do strategically. Because what do employees do when you tell them you're thinking of selling? Well, they think, oh man, my job's at risk. I better brush up my LinkedIn profile. And where are they going to go get a job? Well, they're going to go get a job in the industry because they're going to leverage the experience they've got with your company and the industry expertise that you've given them. And they're going to call your competitor and the other competitors in your space. And all of a sudden, your competitors know you're for sale. And that triggers an over... Uh, you know, a whole sequence of dominoes that basically undermines the value of your company when competitors and suppliers know you're for sale. And so my suggestion is that you divide your, your employees into two buckets. You've got your key managers, your key executive, your C-suite. There may be one, two, three people who you really need to help you get this deal done. Those people need to know that you're thinking of selling and you need to put some sort of incentive plan in place so that they're motivated and, and aligned with you on, on the success of your business. So it can be some sort of success fee uh, or success bonus, if you will. And then you've got the rank and file, everybody else. And those people, unfortunately, I don't think you tell until the check clears your bank account. And again, that's going to make you feel like a, uh, a, you know, a disingenuous lover or someone who's you know, kind of skulking around cheating on your spouse. And it's not, it, it's not a great feeling, but I think it's the only way you can ensure your deal gets done. Also, for, ask you for the best thing for the employees too, because it, it, they can sleep better at not, not knowing. We don't need to know everything. Uh, yeah, they're employees. employees for a reason, right? Yeah, like they're yeah. not entrepreneurs. And yeah. I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, if they were entrepreneurs, if they could handle the, the, the ambiguity, the uncertainty of being an entrepreneur, they'd be one. They yeah, I've experienced it, right. you know, where one of my clients told, uh, I said, don't tell them until we're much further along. It's going to spook them. And, and word's going to get out to your competitors. We're going to call your clients and your clients are going to ask, hey, I heard that you're selling the business. And it exactly happened. And they lost one of their top managers and they lost some clients and everything. So, uh, I, and I've seen it actually happen twice. One of the questions that's asked by the audience is, do, do, the, do the acquirers care about sustainability and corporate social responsibility and practices or policies. Does enter, any of that enter into the equation? It's interesting. Um, we're, we're actually undertaking some research into this because uh, corporate uh, you know, ESG stuff is obviously very top of mind in the world right now. And it is, uh, it, it is something that we're looking at from a research. So I, I can't tell you quantitatively that the impact uh, corporate social responsibility has on 
uh, directly on the value of a company. We do know that we have something called monopoly control, which is inspired. It's one of the eight drivers that we've been speaking about in, in addition to Swiss the structure and recurring revenue. Monopoly control um, is inspired by Warren Buffett, who you know, talked about investing in companies with a deep and wide competitive moat. Because when you have differentiation, when you're competitively differentiated, you've got some pricing authority. And with pricing authority, it allows you to get better margins, better margins, more money to invest in sales and marketing. And so Warren Buffett looks at investing in companies with differentiation. They're doing something unique that, that customers, consumers really value. And so to the extent that corporate social responsibility is something your customers value and your customers view as differentiating, uh, then, it in, then it indirectly enhances your monopoly control score. Uh, so again, I think in and of itself, I'm not sure it helps you, but if your target customer very much uh, uh, values corporate social responsibility, then it very much improves your monopoly sco uh, control score. So it indirectly would impact the value of your company in that, in that way. Another question from the audience. With business models and technology change happening so fast, many companies which may be hot this year become obsolete next year. How do, you, how do your due diligence in this uncertain environment? How do you do your due diligence during this uncertain environment? What a great question. And I think I would attack it from, look, I'm, I'm not a business buyer. Like I'm, I'm 100% in the corner of the business owner who, uh, who we try every day to help, you know, punch above their weight when it comes to selling. So I, I agree with you. I, uh, in, the, in that I think times are changing, right? The acceleration pace, you know, pace is accelerating. Um, I, I looked at a stat recently that said something like, something like 96% of the Fortune 500 companies that were around 50 years ago are no longer around or no longer in the Fortune 500. Like it's, it's I, I don't know the exact stats, so don't quote me on that, but essentially the kind of theme is that it's a huge change. It's a very tumultuous time. We just come through a pandemic. Hopefully it's behind us, knock wood, uh, that was very uh, dis distressful, disruptive for a lot of owners. And so I do agree with you that, that, it, is, that, that it is very difficult to do dil dil due diligence. I'd also say that from a seller's perspective, uh, from an owner's perspective, if you're a business owner, it, um, we have a liability. And that is that we're hardwired to be optimistic. And, and that like, it's just in our DNA as, as entrepreneurs, we think tomorrow is going to be better than today. And that's what gives us the confidence, frankly, to start businesses is because we see the future. We, we have a vision. And, and that optimism can also be our Achilles heel. How? Well, if we always think tomorrow is better than today, it leaves us susceptible to riding it over the top. What I mean by riding it over the top is, is essentially not selling your business soon enough. I, I, I'm reminded of a guy I interviewed on Built to Sell Radio named Rand Fishkin. Uh, have you had Rand on the show, Mark? No, no, but I'm, I, that's one of my questions in, in our list of questions that I sent you. So go ahead with that story. Oh, it's, it's, he's, it's a, I mean, he wrote a great book, by the way. You should have him on. It's called Lost and Founder. Yeah. So if anybody uh, has a chance to pick up that book, it's a great book. So Rand built a company called SEO Moz. Um, he does SEO software, search engine optimization, something, getting your company linked on or uh, uh, displayed on Google. Builds it up to $5 million of annual revenue. It's growing very, very quickly. He's at five, expects to get to 10 next year. So this is a, this is a juggernaut. Along comes a guy named Mark Halligan. And Halligan is a co-founder of HubSpot. And Mark says, hey, we'd like to buy your business. And we're willing to pay $25 million of cash in HubSpot stock. This is a lot of money, right? Rand yeah. didn't grow up rich. This is a lot of money for anybody. And in particular for him, it's five times revenue. But something's rattling around in his head. And that is that, number one, he expects to get to 10 next year. And someone told him a business like his should trade at four times top line revenue. Software company growing very quickly, et cetera. So in his mind, he's going four times 10 is 40. And all I'm getting offered is 25. And so Rand goes back at 40. Mark Halligan says, no, can't do it. And they part ways, they split. And Rand says, okay, well, I don't need you. I'm going to 
build my company. And he raises a round of venture capital, bunch of money, more money than he knows what to do with. And he, and he goes and invests in a series of different products, none of which really are as good as the SEO product. So they start to bleed cash. Ultimately, the, v, the VCs who invested remove Rand from the CEO spot and he's on the sidelines. And I said, Rand, what, what's your equity worth? I, when I was interviewing him, he still mm -hmm. held some Moz. And uh, you know, I said, it must be a bummer to, to be removed, but at least you got your Moz equity. And, and he mm -hmm. said, yeah, maybe, but I have common shares as a founder and the VCs have preferred shares and the VCs get a preferred return. They get all their money out and a yield before I get anything. In fact, John, I don't think my shares, my common shares, based on the length of time they've held their shares, is actually worth anything now. And I said, Rand, what would that offer from HubSpot be worth these days, given the appreciation of the HubSpot stock? Right. He said, he said it'd be worth more than $200 million. Ugh. And he said, my entire net worth uh, at the time I interviewed him was, was $800,000, most of which he was about to spend on elder care. Mm -hmm. And I share that story with you, Mark, because it, for me, it's just, it, it's just a good reminder that we're just hardwired as entrepreneurs to think tomorrow is going to be better than today. And yet it's our greatest Achilles heel. And so um, I do agree with the person who asked the question that we don't know what's coming down the pipe. We don't know when the next pa pandemic. And if you built a successful business, you know, I think there's a really strong case to be made to, to sell it, to, to, to harvest some of that value and then go start another business. I, I, you know, I could see his point. I, I had a client of mine who had a $5 million consulting firm IT at the time, they were really hot and everybody was, you know, buying them up and he was offered 10 million. I said, take the money and run. And he didn't because he believed, you know, that he could grow bigger and get more. And at the end of the day, he actually ended up owing money, you know, over a wow. period of time, every investment he made was bad, got into a partnership. He ended up yeah. uh, in a lawsuit with a partner and everything went bad for him. At the same time, we look at Facebook and, and Mark Zuckerberg was offered $50 million with no revenue at that time than Facebook. And he turned it down. Then he turned down other offers. And now, of course, he's worth like $60 billion. Or but let me ask Mark, but do you think Zuckerberg is happier today than if he taken the 50? Well, because here's my, here's my contention. I, I'll let you answer. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Now, I, I, I think in some respects, you know, the aggravation of uh, running a country, essentially, he's running a country, right? Three yeah. billion people it runs the largest country in the world. But I think there's the other side of it for, and a lot of aggravation to him with all these countries and rules and everything else and the stuff that he has to deal with. And he once was a hero, now he's not a hero or the anti-hero. I think the fact that he and his wife give away so much money is how they get up every morning and keep doing it. And that's why in a sense, he hasn't sold it. I think that's the same thing with Bill Gates over time. Now, Bill Gates only owns 1% of Microsoft over time, but I think they looked at the, at the bigger purpose. That would be my uh, take on it. And the guy you mentioned, I felt bad for him because I'm thinking, man, I might've taken that money, but I can see where he thought it was smart that he had this built-in success story. And then if he diversified, knowing who his client base was, he could make it even that much bigger and it just didn't turn out for him. And, you know, you and I are old enough to know that there's a lot of luck involved in these stories, Absolutely. a tremendous amount of luck. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I think there's a diminishing return on wealth. And what I mean by that is I think, it, uh, you know, if you have nothing and someone hands you a check for a hundred grand, like it's life-changing money for, you know, if, if someone hands you a check for a million dollars, it, it equally is, you've got everything, you know, you got all your, your, your mortgages paid out. Someone hands you a check for 10 million. I mean, you're set for life, yeah. you know, et cetera. But I think there's a point, maybe it's 50, maybe it's a hundred, maybe it's $200 million where actually wealth starts to become a liability. You lose your anonymity. Uh, you lose your security. All of a sudden you're worried about your kids being kidnapped. There is a, 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 a very 
significant downside to extreme wealth. And yes, people like Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg can have incredible influence as they give away their money. But I, for me, I, I know I've spoken to a lot of entrepreneurs and what I think the underlying core need for most of us is, is freedom. I think if you ask most entrepreneurs why they do what they do, it's not to become the next Elon Musk. It's to be free. It's that, that, that tremendous sense of independence of freedom and, that, and how that fills us up to be able to decide what to work, you know, wh what they want to spend money on, how they want to spend their time. That gives us tremendous satisfaction, that sense of freedom. And, and so I think when you reach something we refer to as the freedom point, which is the point in time where you've effectively created enough wealth that you could live for the rest of your life on that money. And it happens much sooner than most people think. When you create that, it's just worth asking yourself, am I willing to risk something I have for something I may not want? Like maybe you think you want a $10 million business or a $20 million business, but Maybe actually you don't. Maybe you really want financial freedom and you're at a point where uh, you could do that. So I think when you reach the freedom point, it's just worth pulling up saying, okay, selling my business would create enough wealth for me to live for the rest of my life. Why am I continuing? And you may have very good reasons for continuing. Maybe because it fulfills you. Maybe because you, uh, you know, there could be thousands of reasons why you want to continue. But I think it's just worth asking why and being clear that you in fact do want to make that trade to give up effectively something you have, which is financial, or excuse me, not give up, but risk something you effectively have, which is financial freedom for something that you're, 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 you're interested in, but you are risking financial freedom. Because as your, as your friend who turned down the $10 million for a consulting business knows, stuff happens, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm totally out of your control. And we're gonna circle back to that because I have a question more toward the end here. So what, what another question from the audience, what type and how long of a holdback should the founder expect as part of the sale? 10% holdback for one year, you know, what should they expect? And, 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 and you write about that in the book as well. Yeah, so, so there's a bunch of different, so holdbacks come in different flavors. Um, an escrow is usually just a 10% holdback, which is really there to ensure that, that there aren't legal uh, challenges to the deal. And almost all deals have a 10% or a small 5% escrow. But the, the acquirer's ability to get that money is very limited to a, a legal battle. So that I would expect. An earnout is where you agree to accept part of your proceeds or put, I should say, part of your proceeds at risk. And they're tied to the future performance of your company. And that's going to be very dependent on what kind of business you have. For example, a professional services company would generally have a much longer and higher proportion of their uh, their proceeds in an earnout. It, for example, in in advertising, it can be as as, as high as seventy percent, seven zero percent of your proceeds at risk in a marketing agency. That's a very extreme example. I'm used to seeing more like thirty percent, but again, it depends incredibly on how structured your business is to run without you personally. Yeah. Um, yeah. It also actually depends on the tenure of your business. I'll give you a quick story. A guy named Rod Drury, who started Zero. Before he started Zero, he started a company called Aftermail. He sold Aftermail for what is a well into New Zealand-based entrepreneur, for what the New Zealand-based papers report is $35 million. In fact, he, he actually sold it for $15 million in cash and $20 million in an earnout. Well, he never hit the earnout and got nothing for that part of his business. So effectively he sold for 15 million, which is still an incredible amount of money, uh, but it's not 35. And so that's what can happen in an earnout. The third type of holdback is when a private equity group buys a majority, but not all of your business. And they ask you to roll some equity into a new entity. And so typically it would be a 60-40 split, something like that, or maybe 70-30, where they buy, for example, 70% of your business, but they say the remaining 30%, we're not going to give you cash for, we're going to ask you to roll that into equity in our deal, effectively in the new company we create to, to, uh, to own your business. And, and that's risky because you then become 
a minority shareholder in a business you don't control. And that can lead to problems because there's no liquidity on those shares. You effectively can't make those liquid. So those are the three types of holdbacks. Escrow, which I would expect in all deals. Earnout, you're going to have a proportion in, in an earnout. The way to minimize that is to do some of the things we talked about today and follow the built to sell kind of methodology. Uh, and then holdback is in, or a, 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 when a private equity group buys your company, expect them to ask you to carry some equity. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a very common strategy. To use. We're talk about that disaster you read about in your book where the person originally they were going to buy the company for a million, but then they offer said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll offer you actually 1.2 million and you carry the paper. And he ended up actually losing money. So talk about that story. Oh my gosh. What a terrible story. Yeah. Um, built up a million dollar construction company and a million dollars in revenue and got an acquisition offer, interestingly, for exactly a million dollars. And he's like, yeah, sure. Where do I sign? The deal was hundred percent cash at closing. And uh, uh, about two weeks before the closing happened, the acquirer called up and said, yeah, we're, you know, we thought we were going to do a million in cash, but now what we want to do is a million two. So we're actually going to increase our offer, but we're going to pay it in, in equal installments over, I think, 10 years or something like that. Like it was a, it was a crazy like a 10 year of time. And Michael, the, the owner of the business said, yeah, wanted the cash in closing, obviously as anyone would, but at that point had sort of intellectually sold his business. He'd moved on in his mind. And so agreed to the deal. Um, two weeks after the deal closed, there was no first check called up the buyer. Buyer doesn't answer the phone. All of his employees had, you know, kind of moved on. Uh, they weren't paying the bills. It was a disaster story. Uh, ultimately he ended up taking the business back. The business was worthless because the employees had left. The customers were, were uh, aggravated and, and so forth. Uh, yet he still owned the bank, uh, some money that he'd taken on as uh, as debt through building it. So it was a disaster story, and it came down to the structure of the deal. And so this this holdback question is a biggie. Yeah, I, I'm not for earnouts either. I think you get your cash up front because you'll never see the rest of that earnout. It's rare that you see all that earnout money. Uh, so here's another question from the audience. Some companies have intrinsic value that no one knows how much money was spent to achieve 5 million in revenue, for example. Does the previous marketing and building infrastructure factor into the equation? Could do, but I, again, just because you've spent $100 million building some widget that nobody wants, that doesn't mean the $100 million is something that you can recover. I, I'm, I'm being facetious to, to, to demonstrate a point. What Acquirers do, look, when a strategic buyer looks at your business, they're going to quietly close the boardroom door. They're not going to let you in. And amongst themselves, they're going to ask a simple question. And that is, would it be cheaper for us to buy this company or compete with this company? And if what you've created would take them years to develop and many millions of dollars to build, they're going to arrive at the conclusion that it would be cheaper to buy you than to invest all that money and time to create what you've created. That only happens when what you've created, they value, right? And they're going to make the conclusion. They're going to say, yeah, we could invest here. We could buy that. We could do this. And, but you know what? It'd be just cheaper if we just buy them. But there is a point where it's cheaper for them to, to compete with you. So that's what a strategic acquirer does. Um, a financial buyer, meaning a private equity group who's buying the second you know, type of person, is buying one thing. And again, let's not confuse what they buy. You know, we want as entrepreneurs, financial, we want to be, we want people to value our location. We got this customer service award. We've got a great brand. We've got a customer list. That was my mistake. We've got all these things. And, and we want to be acknowledged for what we've done in the past. Yet private equity groups don't buy any of those things. The only thing a private equity group buys is your future stream of profit. Let me say that again. What they're buying is your future stream of profit. And the way you can get them to make, the way you can get a private equity group to spend more on your future stream of profit or to value your future stream of profit more is to make it more reliable. 
So that's why a private equity group is so interested in buying companies with recurring revenue or not having a dependency on a single customer employees because it makes your future stream of profit more predictable, more reliable. And that's when they spend a premium to buy, to acquire that future stream of profit. So again, it depends a little bit on the type of buyer you're looking at, um, but I hope that sort of answers the question around investing in, in stuff. So here's another audience question this, uh, this gentleman writes, survivor bias, the challenge is if you sell and they grow it, uh, you have regrets that you may not have been able to grow it in the same way. And then he asked this question, how about the difference between buying your company versus buying your product? Which way is better and what are the risks? So, you know, is it better to keep, you know, XYZ company and keep the company itself and sell them the product? You know, like if it's a, a farm, I guess a pharmaceutical product or, 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 you know, whatever the widget is, or better off uh, and which way is better and what are the risks? So is it better to sell yeah. the company or the product and which is better and why the risk? What are the risks? Yeah, it's, it's somewhat rare to sell just a product, although it does happen. Oftentimes a company will, will acquire a, 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 a single product. Here's the thing. When you sell your company, you're going to have to sell either your assets or your shares. Uh, that's effectively the, 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 the two types of ways that, that a deal gets done. Assets are things like products, trademarks, et cetera. Uh, and so in that case, you're simply buying the things that you, the, the tangible things that you have. So products would be, would be an example. That's buying assets. Buying shares, you're also, you're buying the company. And in that case, you're buying not only the operations of the company, but also its liabilities, Acquirers want to buy assets because they're not inheriting your liabilities. Or unknown liabilities. I mean, I've unknown probably liabilities. been involved with a business that hasn't sold just an asset sale because nobody knows what things that they don't know, even if they have a forensic accountant look at it. So exactly. rarely, you know, unless you're selling Coca-Cola, uh, then it's a different thing. Another question, do you think gender influences valuation of your business? In other words, would female entrepreneurs get offered less than male entrepreneurs for the same type size business? No. Yeah, I, I wouldn't think that would be the case either. Um, no, I mean, and I say that because buyers are, look, look, let's not fool ourselves. Buyers are the most mercenary, most sophisticated executives on the planet. Acquirers are either private equity groups and they are some of the most sophisticated people on the planet or they're CEOs of Fortune 500 companies by proxy being represented by a corporate development department. You will not find a more hardened, more mercenary group of individuals on the planet. They care about what we've talked about today. They care about making money for their shareholders or making money for their partners. And if you are, they don't care what color your skin is, what, what gender you are, what your sexuality is. If you have a company that they can monetize, they will buy it. <laughs> and, and they are mercenary. I can't underscore that enough. They, they, they are ruthless. And uh, it's why Spank sold, a woman entrepreneur sold for billions of dollars, uh, regardless of the gender of the owner or the founder. So I, I, I think they're, they are. Did she sell Spanks recently? I think she took on a private equity investor. Oh, okay. By the way, you were right. Uh, you almost got to the number. Uh, it's 52 of the original Fortune 500 still exists. So oh, you, well. you're, you're tipping right on the money. Um, mm. What, what are the wrong reasons for selling your business? You mentioned some of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've actually done some research on this. Um, we have a tool called Prescore, prescore.com, which basically uh, uh, evaluates your personal readiness to exit your company, your psychological readiness to exit your company. And what we, it was inspired by the fact that we, we saw a lot of owners who ended up regretting their decision to sell their business. And we're like, that doesn't make sense. Like, you know, someone's handing them a check for millions of dollars and you're, you're regretting the decision. We learned that there were four reasons that, that owners regret their decision to sell. And one of them, and this drives to the heart of your question, is you're all push and no pull. 
what I mean by that is that there are reasons to sell your business can be categorized into two reasons. Push factors, things that are pushing you out of your company. And then there are pull factors, which are things you're excited to go do next. Push factors are things like employees aggravate you, government legislation, uh, you know, regulation, et cetera. Those are all push factors, legitimate. Pull factors are things like, I wanna go write a book, I wanna travel, I wanna get fit, et cetera. What we found is that when your proportion of pull factors is smaller than your proportion of push factors, you're in, you're, you're, in, you're, you're in a bad spot. That's not a great spot to be. What you want is more pull factors than push factors. You know, I wrote about and actually interviewed a guy named Sean Oshman. Sean Oshman uh, built a great little IT business in Denver, Colorado. He's 39 years old. And he's like, I want to live on a sailboat. And he'd spent his entire life in landlocked Denver and thought, you know, what he craved was water. Didn't want to be in the desert anymore. And so he said, you know, by my 40th birthday, I want to be living on a sailboat. And so he went out, hired a business broker, got an offer of 2.6 times SDE, which is sort of broker talk for profit. So 2.6 times pre-tax profit. You can think of it that way. And he sold his company. And I interviewed him on Built to Sell Radio. And I said, Sean, you know, like 2.6 times, you know, it's a relatively small company. 2.6 times is kind of an average multiple, but it's not like hitting it out of the park. It's not, a, you know, it's not incredible success. How do you feel about it? And he said, I'm happy as a clam. I'm like, why is that? He said, well, I live on a sailboat. <laughs> and, and it was just a reminder to me that for him, he had all, he was all pulled. He wanted to be and live life on a sailboat. And so the value of his business, while important to him, it wasn't the be all and end all. And so I think that's, you know, to answer your question, what are the wrong reasons? If you're all push and no pull, that's a recipe for disaster. What you want to really think about is what's next? What's really exciting you about? Is it another business? Is it a book? Is it travel? Getting really clear on that, I think, is the recipe for a happy exit. Yeah, you write about the process of auctioning a business. Can you talk about the process, the pros and the cons? And, and do you have to be a certain size business? Because I would think that'd be a pretty large business from a, uh, an auctioning standpoint. Yeah, so um, auction's a big word and there's lots of, lots of variety. What, what you want when you sell your company is competition. And that competition can be simply two bidders bidding over the same business, and it can be more bidders bidding over the same business. The more bidders you have, generally speaking, the higher the value of the company, because you've got multiple people you know, bidding over your company. However, it's much more disruptive, and it can create problems because your customers may find out, your employees may find out. So you, you've got to somehow find the balance between creating a large enough auction or approaching enough uh, owners that you know you can get multiple bidders, right? While not creating so much chaos for your company that you've got hundreds of people bidding on your company and, and kind of the secret gets out. So there's, there's a delicate balance you've got to play there. And it comes down to your degree of confidence in the people that you think will want to buy your business to the extent to which you think they will follow through on that. I'm reminded of a guy named Peter Kelly. Peter built, I interviewed him on Built Cell Radio, Peter built uh, Open Lane, which if you, Open Lane is like, um, it's like an auto trader for used car dealers. Used car dealers buy their inventory on this product called Open Lane. But before Open Lane, they used to do it through these kind of old school auctions where the companies, would, the cars would drive along these conveyor belts. It was a crazy business. And Peter said, you know, this could be reinvented. We could build a website where they could bid on their, 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 uh, their inventory. Peter lived in fear that the, the car manufacturers would create a competitive site. Because if you're a Ford dealer, you're going to buy a used car on FordUsedCar.com, not some third party website. And so he grew this business tremendously successful, but always was worried that the, the, the kind of OEMs and the manufacturers themselves would get wind of this this, this company and compete with them. And so when he went to sell his business, instead of doing a broad auction with hundreds of potential buyers, he went to the three old school uh, auctioneers, the, the people with the cars going by on conveyor belts and said, look, I would like to give you all a chance to buy this business. All three bid on his company. They had bid in the past. And so he knew that they were going to want to make a bid, but he did not go to the manufacturers because he knew that once he went to them, maybe they bid, but if they didn't, they would set up shop to compete with him. 
And so again, that's the delicate balance. You want to get multiple bidders, but you don't want to be um, to be so promiscuous that you've got so many potential bidders that uh, that it could cause chaos. The other thing I'll just say on that point, and then we should move on, is that private equity groups are like sheep. Um, they all have the identical investment criteria. Like I don't, I'm, I'm being facetious. They don't all. No, no, but you're pretty much way. accurate. Just like venture investors and angel investors. Sure. Yeah, 80% of them are the same. It's like, I want a, a reliably profitable business and a unique niche with management that wants to stick around and yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. My, what I would say to you is if you attract the attention of a private equity group, and generally the cutoff is probably around a million dollars of EBITDA, these days, sometimes lower, but that's probably the space. Uh, if you attract the attention of a private equity group, you'll attract the attention of hundreds of private equity groups, or you could attract the attention of private hundreds of private equity groups. So my advice would be don't settle for the first private equity group that comes to you. You're going to want, if you have interest from a private group, you're going to want to shop that business, create an auction, because they will effectively bid the price up because there's so many of them that want to do basically the same deals. Uh, what, what can kill, well, let me ask you this before I ask, you, let me ask you this. What could kill a deal on the second question before we run out of time is I'd like to know what are the hot industries right now? So quickly tell us what would kill a deal? What typically kills deals? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's lots that kills deals. One of the ones that's not quite as well known is gross margin erosion. So what I mean by that is that, um, you know, when you, when you market your business, you market, you show your profit and loss and so forth. And, 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 and people can kind of get interested in your company. Then they go through due diligence. And one of the numbers they look at is your gross margin. And if your gross margin starts to get smaller over time, they might draw the conclusion that in order to pretty up your business, you've been buying revenue. In other words, you've been dropping your price, you'd be competing in, L in, uh, in, in RFPs and effectively manufacturing demand by dropping your price, creating un uh, uh, illegitimate, if you will, demand. And everybody knows that, that, that pricing, uh, a commodity, commodity pricing or, or competing in a price board is, is a race to the bottom. And so a buyer will draw the conclusion that the best days of your company are behind you. And in many cases, we'll actually shy away from companies where the gross margin has been dropping. And that's only something they're going to see in due diligence. And that's why deals often fall apart. It's one of the reasons deals fall apart in due diligence is the through the diligence, the acquirer notices that your gross margin has been dropping. So revenue is important. Being able to show a buyer that your revenue is growing is really important. But if it comes at the expense of your gross margin, it can be a fool's errand. Uh, so I would I would rather see you grow more slowly, but maintain your gross margin than sort of artificially jack your top line, only to see the gross margin shrinking. They'll figure it out in due diligence. I'll tell you, I experienced this where uh, one of the first companies I sold was I was in partnership with two other guys, and we had a big acquirer who wanted to buy the business, and all three of us were involved with the acquisition. We took our eye off the revenue ball. And so instead of revenue keep going up, revenue fell backwards. And they said, look, we got to re, uh, we got to come up with a new number because you're not hitting the numbers you were supposed to be hitting. Mm -hmm. And so that was a real learned lesson because after that, when have time ones, I say only one person is going to deal with the uh, buyers and the rest of us are going to focus on sales because right away they gave themselves a discount on the buying. And we ended up uh, canceling the deal, spending a year, uh, rebuilding that revenue and sold it to somebody else, but we learned a valuable lesson. And so the last question I have for you is what are the top, what are the hot industries that people are interested in buying? I don't mean to dodge the question, but right now the private equity world is so flush with cash that there is a private equity group or private equity roll up in just about any industry. And that's a great time for, for sellers. So your dental practices are rolling up. Uh, auto dealerships are being rolled up. Garden centers are being rolled up. There's virtually, I, I can't even, like virtually every industry that is uh, that you can think of, um, there's a roll up going on. And so I would consider that a hot industry that a lot of acquirers are chasing. Again, private equity companies are cheap. So once somebody says, okay, we're going to do a roll-up for uh, pharmacies, 
as an example, there'll be four other private equity groups that are doing exactly the same thing. So I, I think it's a really exciting time for, for entrepreneurs who've built a business. There's lots of, of potential acquirers out there. John, people have to get this book. It's a fabulous book. It's a quick read, but lots of valuable information. If you're looking to buy or sell a business, this book is definitely worthwhile getting. And I appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. And when you come out with the next book, you got to let us know so we can have you on again. Love to do it. Yeah. You have new friends in Philadelphia, so I hope you'll come out and visit sometime. <laughs> have a, a great rest of your day and a great and safe weekend. Everyone, please have a safe weekend. Take care. Take care, everybody.